Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> um, I apologize, uh, Marco, um, for the late start. I was having troubles with my computer connecting to Adobe um, Illustrator. Um, I think everything is working properly now. We shall see. Anyway, um, today and tomorrow, we're going to be working with typography. I don't know how much um, all of you know about typography, so I'm assuming that you know absolutely nothing. So before we actually do the lesson, what I would like to do is give you um, some information and background on type itself. Um, I also want to show you in the character panel what all of these tools do. And then tomorrow we will um, do the lesson itself. Um, they tell you how to do the lesson step by step, um, how to snap to glyphs, how to select typefaces, how to create character and paragraph styles and everything else. But they really don't give you a rundown of what all of these tools do and which pertain to typography. So I'm going to start by I have a handout on my um, website um, called Typography Basics. And so that's what I'm going to start with today. And then I'll continue through. And then before I begin the lesson, um, I'm going to go over each of the, the, the variations or the tools that you can use with typography in the character panel. And again, you can go to Window. And you can select character panel from there, or you can do it from the properties panel, whichever works for you. Okay, so let's start typography basics. Um, the typeface that I've used for the word typography and the basics is um, Roman. Um, it is real Roman type, the typeface Roman is really the origin of all of modern typography. Um, it, it was the type itself was lift, lifted from Trajan's column in Rome. Um, there was a, a specific proportioning system that was used, and there are no lowercase letters. Um, it's still today very elegant um, typeface, um, but that's what I'm using to um, to highlight some of the the. the the different sections of my lecture today. Anyway, that's where type or, or modern type or modern typography began was actually um, lifting from Trajan's column in Rome. Um, the first thing that you should know about type or, typography are the basic categories of type. Um, and there are technically five. Um, really, there are only three, but um, in, in in practice, but there are technically five. There's serif and sans serif, which were the most widely used um, categories of typography. Um, there is script, black letter, and decorative typefaces. Most everything falls into the decorative category. Even script and black letter today fall into the decorative typeface uh, category. Serif, as you can see, are these little appendages that stick, stick out from the letter forms themselves. Those are serifs and how they originated when they were chiseling the type in uh, uh, stone or marble during, during the day, time of the Romans. Um, it was from the the tool itself that created those serifs. Um, and today, while they may appear to have a decorative quality, they actually actually are functional and lend in the um, readability of type, especially for um, type that's used for uh, um, the, sm the smallest type that you see that will be for books or um, in magazines and newspapers and that sort of thing. Um, then in the later years, um, actually starting maybe in the 1930s or so, um, modern type faces developed and they were able to, by 
change in the proportioning systems, they were able to um, uh, create uh, various um, widths and lengths for different letter forms themselves. And by doing so, they were able to remove the serifs. So these are the two that are most widely used. They can be used for capital letters or they can be used for body copy. Um, script, again, is based on the hand-lettered um, letter forms used by a pen, either a broad pen or a pointed nib pen. Um, anyway, today it has more of a decorative function. <clears throat> it's used specifically for um, uh, when you for maybe um, announcements, wedding announcements, or birth announcements, and things like that. Um, I don't recommend using script for body copy. Um, in this day and age, it's when you use too many letter forms in a block of text, it's too difficult to read. The same goes for black letter and, and decorative. Black letter was developed during um, um, around the thousand. AD um, <clears throat> with the monks when they were hand lettering <clears throat> their, um, their manuscripts. And it was also at that time that they developed the lowercase letters. Again, they used a, a broad tipped pen to get the, the thick and thins of the letters. <clears throat> then again, with the advent of um, more modern typefaces, they came up with a whole bunch of decorative uh, choices and that you'll see today. Um, so I recommend for headlines, you can use script, black letter, and decorative. For body copy, um, you should really stick to serif and sans serif. Serif and sans serif can also be used for headlines as well. Within those categories, <clears throat> there are other subgroups. There's the family face and font. So what you'll see more often than not in all um, computer programs, whether it be Word <clears throat> or um, Illustrator or Photoshop or whatever, you're gonna see what font you wanna choose. Well, fonts exist within, specific, within a broader category of a, of a typeface, okay? So the typeface in this particular instance would be Helvetica. And you can see under the typeface Helvetica that there are a whole, and I haven't even put all of them here, a variety of fonts. There it goes from condensed bold, condensed black, all the way to bold italic and anything in between. Then <clears throat> each of these typefaces fall under a specific category or family. And the family of type would be the categories that I talked about. So this would be um, Helvetica would fall under sans serif is your basic type family, okay? So that's how it goes, the type family or category. And then within that, you will have specific typefaces, but then within a typeface, you could have individual fonts. Now, <clears throat> what a font is, is that it is, a designer has, um, within that category of typeface, such as Helvetica, um, an individual font, what they have done is they have designed all the individual capital letters, the lowercase, the numerals, and the special characters that all work in concert with one another. Sometimes they may seem very similar, and they are, but there are unique differences that make them work well with one another. So um, while Illustrator and Photoshop give you the option of creating what is called a faux bold or faux italic and that sort of thing, I encourage you to stay away from that if at all possible. But there are some typefaces that do not have that many fonts available. So sometimes you have to kind of fudge a little bit. And if you want to enhance the weight of the, the typeface itself, then maybe um, that individual font will have to use a faux bold or something of that nature. So that breaks it down into the different categories or families, typefaces, and then the individual fonts. Okay, so that's what you'll see in an illustrator. It won't 
give you face or category. It will talk about specifically, you know, what font you want to choose. <clears throat> the next thing that I wanted to talk about were the different uh, are the different um, um, parts of the letter forms. Um, uh, the body parts that you see here um, are the basics. There are more that we could talk about, but this is just, I want you to understand that um, the letter forms themselves, when you type them out or you insert them in Illustrator, or Photoshop, or some other program, is that all of those letter forms rest on what is called a baseline. And there are tools that allow you to um, raise the type above or below the baseline, if you wish. You'll also notice that the curve letter forms are, don't sit right on the edge of the baseline, but sit below just a, just a tad. That's an optical effect, is that if I, we were to move it above and to have it sit right on the baseline, it would look like it, raised, it was raised above the B, okay? So that's the baseline. All the, the letter forms rest on the baseline itself. Then what we have um, in the middle here is called the waistline. Okay. And you'll notice that the waistline for some typefaces changes. Um, um, this is the midpoint, usually um, the, and the distance from the baseline to the waistline is called the X height. It's not talked about that much anymore, but typically um, with this particular typeface that we've used here is that um, the, 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 the lowercase letters actually rise above the, the midpoint a little bit. So that's just the basic design that was used here. Um, then in addition to that, we have um, what are called ascenders and descenders. So anything, any part of a letter form that extends below the baseline is called the descender. Anything that extends above the waistline is called an ascender. So typically the vertical stroke, for example, of the D um, would be an ascender. So that rises above. Now, in addition to that, um, we need to know how type is measured. Um, I will talk about that in just a minute, that it's talk, that we measure type in points and picas. But the, the way type is, is measured goes from the top of the A sender to the bottom of the D sender of whatever font you are using. Um, if, you, if you want, you can also specify um, a cap height that maybe the letter form um, sits, um, because as you can see with this particular um, typeface, actually this has changed somehow. Um, I used Times Roman in the past, so I'm not quite sure why this has changed. Um, but with Times Roman, the A sender actually extends above the cap height. So that's, um, depending on the design, will determine um, the, the actual size of a, the appearance when you specify a certain size type. So again, type height is based on um, top of the A sender to the bottom of the D sender. And then if you wish, you can also specify a cap height or an X height if you wish. So those are the basic um, basic nomenclature of the parts of the letter forms. Um, as I mentioned just a moment ago, type is measured in points and picas. Um, there are 12 points to a pica, and there are six picas to an inch. And if you do the math, six times 12, you get 72 points in an inch. So it gives you a ballpark idea. Uh, um, a, a ballpark yeah, um, idea of the size of the type. If I say I want it 72 points, that from the top of the A center to the bottom of the D center, it's probably an inch, okay? Um, however, again, depending on the design, the cap height might be less than an inch, okay? 
So that's how type is measured. Then some of the other terms that are used in, in typography are capital letters are also called uppercase or UC. The small letters are also called lowercase or LC. And where that terminology came from, uppercase and lowercase, was back in the day. For example, um, in the 18th century, when um, printers um, like Benjamin Franklin uh, actually had to hand set the type. And so in, they had cases of letters that they had to put in blocks. And the capital letters were in cases that were above. So those were called the uppercase. And then those small letters were in cases below. So they were called lowercase. Pretty straightforward, but that, can, that terminology continues today. Um, then there are tools available in Illustrator that allow you to selectively adjust the space between words and between individual letter forms. That term is called kerning, and that can be a very important tool for you in, to, to use in the character panel. If you want to uniformly change the distance between letter forms and words, that is called tracking. And then very often you're going to have to adjust the space between the lines of type. And that is called letting. Now, again, that term letting, how did that come to be? That only happened, again, um, back in the 18th century when, again, um, printers such as uh, uh, um, Benjamin Franklin um, wanted to add additional space between the, um, the lines of type. And so what they would do is they put little slivers of lead between the lines. And again, that's where the term came to be. Um, and it is stuck, it's still there. So these terms are used a lot. Again, it's just, I'm covering just basics. So I want to make sure that you um, get a sense of that. And so that when you're using the tools in Illustrator, you understand how they work. Now, in a typical ad, and this is not an ad, this is a tabloid sized newspaper. So technically, this is not a headline. In an ad, it would be for a newspaper, this would be a masthead. Um, and then um, in a newspaper, this would be a headline, not a subhead. And then this would be um, your copy or body copy, whatever you want to call it. And typically, they, the way that they work is the most important elements are the largest. They usually sit at the top of the page and then in descending order, um, the less important elements get smaller and smaller and sit at the bottom of the page. So. Your headlines or mastheads are the largest typographic element, usually. Then your heads or sub, subheads are a little bit smaller in size. And then your um, copy um, is the smallest element, usually. So that's the, the order that they go in size. Now, if you want to know the basic sizes, and they there is a, a wide variety of of a range of sizes that you have for each of these. But copy generally goes from eight to 13 point. Um, generally eight or nine is pretty a, com a pretty common size. And column width goes from 13 and a half to 48 picas. If it's much less than 13 and a half picas, it's really hard to track from line to line. And the same applies for the maximum width of type of a line of type. And if it goes beyond 48 picas, it's difficult for the eye to track from one line to the next. So those are pretty good um, standard widths that you would use. Um, again, depending on the size of, of copy that you decide upon, um, will determine you know, if you want wider or narrower um, widths of the columns. If you look at any newspaper, they're generally 13 and a half <coughs> picas. 
or 13.6. And then um, in books, they generally don't go any wider than 48 items. Subheads, depending on the size of document that you're creating, can range from 14 to 18 points. Again, ballpark. And then headlines can go from 24 point on eight and a half by um, 11 sheet of paper. Depending if you're designing a poster, they can be several inches tall. But those give you some ballpark sizes. Okay, so that's some um, my basics of typography. Now I'm going to come over here, and as I said this is the the end file for our type lesson. And if we look at the start file, it gives us all the illustrations here. But we're going to be adding type to it, and this is what I will do tomorrow. In the meantime, though, I want to go over with in the character panel and show you what all of these tools do. Um, so I'm going to go to File, New. And I want to select just the eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper. Okay. So I want letter size, and I'm going to make it horizontal. It really doesn't matter the size. There we go. Okay. Dope. So again, we'll go ahead and I'm going to tear off the tab for the type tool over here because there are variations, lots of variations. Okay. So we have by default the type tool. If you want type to fill a, um, an area, you might use this variation of it. If you want type to follow a path, you would use this tool. If you want type to be stacked and to, um, to appear vertically, you would use that. And likewise, if you want type to um, appear vertically, but within a defined area, you could use that or type vertically along the path. And then the last one here is um, touch type which is a relatively new feature. So to use the type tool, um, you just select the type and type tool, and then you can click anywhere on your, um, your artboard. Boom. When I do that, notice that it gives us what is called Greeking. It's called Warren Ipsum. And I'm gonna go ahead and zoom in a little bit so we can see this a little bit better. And now what we can do, either using the options menu along the top, um, using the character panel in the properties panel over here, or I um, went to the, um, the window menu and I brought up the character panel from here. So by default, it selects Myriad Pro regular as the font. If you want to change that, you can just simply click here. Come on. Kind of sluggish. And then you can see here all the variation or all the other typefaces that are available. If they're not available, as you've seen in previous exercises, you're going to have to activate fonts on the, um, on the Adobe um, website. So for example, if I wanted Arial Black or just plain old Arial, Okay. We can also filter these. Um, we can, you know, by font classification. We can, so if I want just to see just sans serif, serif, or something else that we didn't talk about, but would be another one, which would be slab serifs, which are kind of squared off. And what we also talked about, we have script. Okay. We have black letter. We have monospace. This is kind of goes back to the old days of old typewriters before computers that they all letter forms were evenly gave the same amount of width space. So if you want to use a monospace, you can do that. 
than we have here. Again, handwritten, which we're getting into decorative letter forms, and the same here, more de decorative letter forms. So that gives you, you know, if you want to go by classification, you can. If you have starred a, a specific typeface, you can. So I'm going to go to Arial. Let's just use that for the moment. Okay. And I'll click off of that. And I have Arial regular. If I want to switch to, um, if there are other variations of that, um, for example, if I want it bold, I can select. And notice as I hover over, over each of these, it gives me a preview of what it's going to look like. So that's very helpful. So I'm just going to stick to regular for the moment. So I have Arial regular. Now I need to determine the size. Um, again, by default, it uses 12 point. Remember we said there are 12 points to a pica. And again, that's measured from the um, A sender to the D sender. If I want to enlarge it, just click here. And while everything is highlighted, because you can specify um, a different size for each letter form, I'm going to click off of that and move over. So you can see what's going on here. There we go. So with the type selected, you'll notice that you see the baseline. Then if I want to now go ahead and change, and I'm just going to use my name. I'm going to go back to the type tool, select it, highlight the text, and I'm just going to put my name in here just for the heck of it. There we go. So now we can go ahead and edit. And by default, it uses point type. So what does point type mean? It means that if I continue to type, but let's say I wanted something on another line of type. Uh, I didn't want to do that. I'm going to cancel that. So I'm going to select that. And you have to be careful because what you, if you haven't noticed just yet, if we look at layers, OK? All of this will be on a on the same layer, but every time you start and stop a new um, group of, of text, I'm going to click back in here. There we go. So if I go back over here, I'm going to use my arrow keys to move to the end. I put the space and I begin to type. So if I type some more type, it will just continue to um, typing on the on the single line. So um, if I wanted to put this on a, a separate line, I would have to come here and hit the return key. Okay, now let's go back and I can correct. Now, there's another way that we can work this too. I can come back to this. And if I want this to um, follow a, a block of text, I can double click here. And now what it does is it will if I want to type more, I'm going to come in and it will be fixed to this size box unless I increase the size or decrease the size of the, of the, of the box. So now um, I'm going to go ahead and highlight this and I'm going to put an arch one six. So you'll notice that now that I change that, it's not moving to the next line um, because it will only fill this space of the box. So what I can do is I can come down here and I can move this like so. And notice as I increase the size of the box, it will fill, um, it will allow me to see the rest of the text. Likewise, I can change the width and that will affect it too. Okay. Now you'll also notice a little red box in the lower right-hand corner. That means that there is still more text. And if you wish to create a separate text box, we can do that. I can click there. And if I click over here, notice that it created another text box for me. So I'm going to undo some of these. I'm kind of getting ahead of myself a little bit. I can always go back to double-clicking that, and I can go back to a single line of text. So let me go back and let's take all of this. And I'm just going to 
because I already had the return. I'm going to get rid of that. Go back again. So that enables us to use point type or create a block of text. Now, if you want to change the font, again, you have to highlight the text. And if I only want to change one letter form and just select one letter form, and if I want to go from Arial to another one, if I want to go from that to maybe, um, let's see. I want to use an emoji. Again, my computer is having problems today. So let's use American, let's use bank, gosh, that's really, something like that. I don't know. There we go. How about the script? So here is a good example. So I'm using script for the first K. And you'll notice that if I highlight that letter form, it tells me that it's 60 point. And so is so are all of these. So you can see that depending on the font you choose and how it's designed will determine that you know what you think will be a certain height will be the case. It may not be the case that um, depending on its design, they will there will be a variation. Now, in order for this to work, I need to use some other tools here. I need to highlight this because I probably I want the K to be a little bit larger. So I have to highlight it. And now what I can do is I can go ahead and I can bump this up. So let's go all the way to 72 and see what I get here. Now you can go beyond 72 or it's going really sluggish. So I apologize. So I selected 72 and that's still not large enough. So what I need to do is I'm gonna put in here my own size and I'm just gonna put in maybe 96 and see what I get. Okay, and that is, isn't even enough. So I'll put in maybe, I don't know, 100 and, 108. I want it a little bit larger than all the rest. And it's about the same size. But notice if the, the kerning, the overlap between these, so that it overlaps the, the I. So if I wanted to increase the space between the K and the I, then what I would need to do is I would come down here and this tool right here is what we use for kerning. So with the cursor between the K and the I, I'm gonna come over here and let's jump all the way to 200 and see what we get. And there we go. Notice that it just almost touches the eye. And if that's what I want, fine. If I want maybe the little dot over the eye to be inside that, I could knock that back a little bit. So let's try 100 instead and see what that, where that gets us. Yeah, so that fits perfectly. So that might be kind of a fun thing to do with our type. So I've mixed the type faces or the fonts, I should say. Um, <laughs> I've also adjusted the kerning. Now, what if I wanted the space between the entire block of text here to be uniformly stretched out or more condensed? So then what I'm, I would do is I would select the type again. So let's select it all. I'm just gonna hit Command A. And I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna use the, um, the tracking tool here. So if it's greater than zero, okay, notice that it's stretching out and you can extend beyond 200. If you want it to be set tighter, okay, then you would use a negative number like so. So let's go ahead and stretch it out just a little bit. Boom. So now that it's all stretched out uniformly. Okie doke. And again, if I wanted to put the eye back in here a little bit, I would have to adjust the kerning for that again and make it significantly 
<clears throat> um, smaller than what I had before. So that's what the kerning does. This is what the tracking does. Then if I wanted to, I could uh, selectively adjust the height and the width of the letter forms. I don't encourage you to use these two tools here, but they will um, let us do that. So if I, again, if I highlight everything, like so, now I can come in here and I can click. And again, if I want to increase, notice how it's stretching it vertically, but it's keeping the, the width the same. So it will allow me to do that. So I'm creating by default kind of a condensed typeface, but it's distorting the letter forms, which I think the designers would be having a heart attack right now if they saw me doing this. So that's what that does. Likewise, this one here, if I wanted to create condensed type, notice that if I use this one here, so let's go back to the next one. I'm gonna keep that at 100. Let's use this one over here. So I'll use this one to the right of it. Click here. And again, if I shrink and I go to a smaller, oops, whoa, whoa, whoa. No, 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 no. I didn't want to do that. I want right here. So let's do there. Okay, there you go. So now it's keeping the height the same, but it's changing the width. And likewise, if I stretch it out, it's keeping the height the same, but changing the width. And if I have more space width-wise, it's gonna create what appears to be a, you know, a smaller typeface, but in fact, it's the same. So I'm gonna go back to 100%, just leave it alone. Um, as I mentioned, that we can control the type on the, um, the baseline and control it. So for example, what if I wanted this I to be above the baseline? Then I would use this tool down here. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to bump this up. Let's just use 12 point. And you can see that now it ra it's raised above the baseline. So now I've done that. If you want to rotate any, any of the type, so maybe I want to take the R's and I want to rotate them clockwise or counterclockwise, I can do that. So that's what this one does. So let's go ahead and rotate it 45 degrees. Let's take the other one and rotate it minus 45 degrees, okay. see what we get here. So we'll go ahead and here. And this is this way you can have um, kind of a lot of fun and uh, choices for yourself in the design, overall design of your, you know, when you're using type. Now, some other things that we can do. So I'm gonna get rid of all of what I just did here. This is looking, it's kind of my like computer's working kind of skittish. It's really taxing the memory of this. So I'm just going to delete it and I'm going to go back again to my basic. I'm not going to use 108 because it goes back to the last one that we used. I'm going to maybe select 48 point and let's also focus on the letting because I didn't do that. I'm going to switch to auto for the time being. Come on. And for the tracking, I'm going to set that to none. I'm all going back to <clears throat> all of the basics. Um, take this back to no points, so it rests on the baseline. 100%, 100%. So I think I've reset everything. Let's go back again with a type tool and type again. And I didn't want that. So I'm going to go back to um, Arial. 
And you can also, now that I know the typeface, I can type it in. So type in Arial Regular. There we go. And I'm going to type in my name. Oh, no, 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 no. Yeah, my computer, my computer. <clears throat> Let's try this again. Switch to Arial. <clears throat> Everything is working so sluggishly. Not sure what the cause of that is today. It's happened before, and then other days everything works just fine. Um, come on. There we go. So I've got some basic type here. I'm going to move this over. I can see it a little bit better. And put my name in, in here again. And we can go ahead and go back to the move tool and just move this around anywhere you want. So initially, when you're creating type, it's not important where you place it. It's easy to move it afterwards. So one of the things that you may want to do is when I have this block of text selected, if you want to select here, this gives you all caps. Okay. Um, I caution you against using all caps um, for a large block of text. It will be difficult for the reader to read, you know, the viewer to read. In place of that though, what I like using or what are called small caps. And what that does is it takes all the lowercase letters and it turns them into smaller caps. So you get the same emphasis. You know, you begin to emphasize the, that block of text, but a little bit differently. Okay, so that's kind of a nice approach. Then if we come back here, I'm gonna go back again and I'm gonna create another line of text. I'm gonna hit the return key and I'm gonna just type some more. Now notice that it used, you know, the settings that I had from that I just changed. So if I want to ch change that back, I have to turn that off. So what I haven't covered yet is the letting. That's the space between these two lines of text. That's covered up here. This is the default amount of letting for 48 point. Now, if I highlight both of these lines and I want to bring that up a little bit, I can go ahead and I can use the little arrows. And I didn't want to do that. Let's go back again. I'm going to go back to default or auto. There we go. So let's go instead um, a 57. If I want it set a little bit tighter, maybe I should go ahead and use 48. So it's actually set solid. But because I don't have any ascenders or descenders, it still looks sort of a lot of space between the lines. So maybe I'll jump to 36. Well, that might be a little bit too tight. Depending on what I'm designing or my choice, that might be just right. You can also overlap lines of type if that works for your design. So that's what that does. It actually, you know, line by line, you can adjust um, the letting. Um, I would, for your, um, your body copy, I would let the computer use the auto settings and just leave that alone. It's, it's more when you're um, designing titles or logos or, um, um, anything that's fairly large on your your page that you're going to want to um, selectively adjust the spacing between the lines of type. Okay, so I'm going to go back again and I'm just going to set this to auto. There we go. 
The next thing that we have here is that we have um, super and subscript. So for example, after, let's put it after the, the E, if I have a one. Now, if I wanted to uh, superscript, I select, whoops, select it and there we go. Yeah, so that makes it a little bit smaller. Come on, there we go. And places it above. If I want a subscript, then again, I can select it, select that individual letter form, and I click this one right here. Now I have subscript. If I want um, to have underline, then select what letters you want underlined. So if I only wanted the O to be underlined, I would select it and then click this little button right here. Now it's underlined. To me, this looks a little horsey. It's a little bit too bold and cumbersome. If I wanted um, strike through, through all of this, I could click here, and the last button right here. And that's what that does. That too looks a little horsey, but that let's, gives us um, another choice. Um, what we have down here at the bottom, very bottom are glyphs, which we'll get to tomorrow. And it's a way of um, aligning our text to glyphs um, in the design and makes it a little bit easier for us and a little bit quicker and a little bit more accurate by doing so. The other thing that I wanted to cover briefly is I want to show you, and it is important if you do set a lot of text um, and you use the, um, the spell checking feature of Adobe Illustrator, that what you're gonna to want to do is make sure that you determine what language you're using. So the one that I always use, it's my kind of fallback here. Now I'm gonna highlight all of this. And I'm going to make sure that I turn off strike through. And let's turn off um, underline. There we go. <clears throat> um, I'm going to write the, write the word Montreal. Okay, so I'm working in English. But if I highlight this, and I decide that I'm actually working in French, because sometimes the documents that you create will be for multiple languages or be distributed in multiple locations. So let's go back up here and let's select French and they have French Canadian. So maybe we're sending it here. And you'll notice it doesn't change anything. Where it will have an effect is that when I do my spell check. So I come up here and I go to edit and I want to go to spelling and I want to go to check spelling. And it will go through all of the type I'll go ahead and click start. Now, <clears throat> words not found, okay? So if I select Kirk Miller, it's not gonna find that. What I could do is just for this though, I want to ignore that. For Montreal, I don't. So I'm gonna go back again. Let's do that again. And let's highlight it and let's go to edit and let's go to spell checking. Let's go ahead and start again. Very sluggish. So the word Montreal is the one that comes up. And remember, I specified that this was in French Canadian. You know that there's a, 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 a accent grave over the E. So I'm gonna go ahead and change it. And I'm done. So that's, it will, you know, change spelling for different languages, which is really, really nice.
Now, if I with this highlighted again, if I switch back to English, it will do the same thing. I'm going to go back to English, and it also has um, English for, you know, are we in the UK? Or are we in, you know, United States? So let's go back, find English. USA English you versus UK English. So I'm going to select that. And again, it's not going to change it here. Where it will change it, though, is again, when I go to edit, and I go to spell check, and it will come up again, and it will pop up. As Montreal, you could leave it with the accent. Rob, let's go ahead and start. Montreal. Notice that in English, we do not put the accent over it. So I can go ahead and change it and select that. And it's fixed it for us. So that's what this does. So that's pretty much all I wanted to cover today. Um, give you a little background of typography and nomenclature used um, in typography. How explain how type is measured. And what you see on my screen right now, and you'll see that I have um, a character panel. One of the other things that we'll be doing tomorrow is that you can create um, character styles and paragraph styles, which were really very nice. We'll make um, short order once they're set up of your design, and it will become a little bit more, uh, again, accurate and um, speedy to do so for you to do that. Um, and also, these are some examples of some glyphs. So this is the glyph menu here that you can add if you wanted to. You know, the at, at sign or plus sign, the dollar signs, and things like that for the particular font. Um, so that's what we're going to do um, tomorrow is we're going to switch back over here. Here's the start file for our menu. And let me close some of these so you can see what's going on here. And I'll just move the glyphs panel away from here. There we go. So this is a start file. And we're going to add some text up here. And we're going to add some text to our menu. And we're going to modify the paragraphs. And we're going to have text follow a path, which we haven't done today. Um, and have um, apply some filters to the text to have it arc. There's a variety of things that you can do. Um, and that's what, if I look at the finished version here. You can see that the rainbow trout, how it arcs a little bit. Um, very nice. Okay. How we can work with blocks of text and decide whether you want one, two, three paragraph, three columns, um, that sort of thing. Um, adjust the, um, you don't have to always work with a rectangular uh, uh, block of text. You could also, use an image to, um, if I select this, this is one of, I think to find one of the nicest features here. If I select this and I move this down, it will, the text will wrap around it. You can see how it's wrapping around that. It doesn't work, but it, it, it's really kind of a nice feature. It's almost like the text, the little icon here or the little logo becomes a, uh, magnet and it pushes away, you know, rather than attract, it pushes the type away from it. Very nice feature. And it's doing that right now to keep a distance away from it. So there's lots that we could do. And as I said, the glyph selection to make sure that the type aligns with the glyphs that we have. So that's what we're going to be doing tomorrow while we're working on this exercise. I just wanted to give you a little bit of background of, of type and show you how all of these tools work so that when you select a type, um, you understand what the different categories are, what the different um, families of typeface are, um, fonts, so on and so forth, and what all these tools do. Again, so if I you know, come down here and I select the options, 
then there's more for paragraph settings. As I said, style settings, we have a whole bunch of things that we can um, change and modify. Type is a very powerful tool in Illustrator. It's probably one of the best tools of any Adobe program or any other program that I know about. If you're working with type and you want to create logos or you want to work with type in any shape or form, with the exception of creating booklets or books or booklets, then you would probably use InDesign. But for one sheets like this, um, you won't find a better tool for working with type as well as um, stylized illustrations. It works really, really nice. So that's all I have to say for today. I will have this posted on YouTube within the hour. Um, I was having trouble earlier. And my computer is still acting a little sluggish. Not sure why. Um, but anyway, um, hopefully things will go a little bit more smoothly tomorrow. Anyway, I'm going to say goodbye. I'm going to stop the recording.